Hello and welcome back! In the previous video, we completed the construction of the enclosure for the Mark 8 mini computer. We left off by drilling holes for the backplane. In this video, we will install the computer into the enclosure, but before we do that, let's go back in time a bit to when we started testing and debugging the computer, as this testing process is important. Before we start with the testing process, there is one thing we missed during the assembly of the boards, and that is the jumper wires on the output board. Notice that we can designate up to 7 output ports with the jumper wires. Since this is the first output board, we can set the port positions A through D to positions 1 through 4, to define the output ports 1 through 4 as the ports uh, on this board. Also. Don't forget the required jumper to the left of the capacitor. Ok, let's start testing this computer. Since we've already installed all the boards into the backplane, we can move on to the wiring. At the top of the computer, connect the LED register board, the memory board, and the input multiplexer board together using an 8 position cable. I created a simple harness using a 16 wire cable, but only 8 wires are actually utilized. Next, connect the other connections at the top of the boards based on the drawing created by Brian Blackburn. If you're using the switchboard that I designed, you can utilize the GitHub documentation, uh, link to it in the description, uh, to determine where each pin of the J1 connector goes. It should be pretty straightforward. There is one mistake in Brian's drawing. Uh, there's no connection to the left of the L connection, so we can just mark it out. Also, the connection to the right of L is not used, so we can cross it out. At this point in time, I'm still using an unstuffed prototype switchboard with some of the switches installed temporarily. Those are the momentary switches. This will help with testing. A breadboard will be used to mimic the remaining switches. Let's start our testing by referencing the checkout and startup process annotated in the original construction manual. Step 1 is to check the wiring of all the switches and components ensuring that all the necessary connections have been made and that no solder bridges exist. The external interrupt jumper on the memory address uh, manual control module should be set for the time being. We may remove it later when using an external device. Step 2 is to ensure that the voltages coming from the power supply are correct. To do this, we can disconnect the power supply from the computer and check the voltage difference between ground and positive 5 volts and ground and minus 9 volts. The voltages should be very close to those values, preferably slightly higher to compensate for the voltage drop that occurs between the power supply and the computer. Next, connect the power supply to the computer. Ensure that the Intel 8008 microprocessor is not installed at this time. Place the control switch in the jam and step modes. Set the switch register to all zeros. Check the voltages on the pins where the 8008 microprocessor will be installed. Only pin 1 should be reading minus 9 volts. The rest of the pins should show voltages between ground and positive 5 volts. If other pins display minus 9 volts, check for solder bridges before proceeding. In step 4, we can insert the 8008 into its socket and power on the computer. The LED register display will have some of the LEDs lit up. It's usually random which ones light up, but it's generally not a good sign if all the LEDs are on every time. With the switch register set to all zeros, toggle the load address high and load address low switches. Both the high and the low address light should go out. If nothing happens when you toggle those switches, check the connections of the control switches. If all the LEDs light up instead, check to see if the switch register is connected backwards. If you still have issues, consult the original document for more debugging information. 
Let's try examining some of the memory locations to ensure that the examine circuit is working properly. As you can see, the examine circuit is not working properly. It seems to be sporadic, so something is obviously wrong here. Let's do some debugging and try to figure it out. After some debugging and probing around with my voltmeter and oscilloscope, I think we may have found the issue. The 74193s are counters and during the examine and deposit cycles, they are supposed to count up. However, it seems that the counter sometimes counts down instead of up. According to the documentation for the 74193, the direction of count is determined by which pin is pulsed. In this case, pin 11 is being pulsed, which means the direction is up, but as the datasheet states, the down pin, which is pin 4, must be held high when this pulse occurs. Looking at the schematic, we do not see anything connected to pin 4 on these ICs. My guess is that pin 4 is receiving interference from a nearby signal, causing the device to toggle up and down sporadically. Let's install pull-up resistors to uh, pin 4 of all 4 of the 74193s and see what happens. I soldered a few wires and 1K resistors to pin 4 of the 4 ICs and connected them all to 5 volts. Let's install the board back into the computer and see if it changed anything. Look at that! It seems to have fixed the issue. We can now examine the memory contents by toggling examine. One side effect of this change is that now when I toggle the load address high switch, it also loads the address into the low position. The same occurs when toggling the load address low, uh, the high address is also set. We will investigate this issue later. I'm also noticing that one LED on the output register is always on. Let's do some debugging to see what's happening with it. The issue persists even with just the LED register board and memory board installed in the computer. This narrows it down to one of these boards. I have a hunch that it might be a bad memory I see, so let's try swapping them around and see if it changes anything. And it does. It appears to be a bad memory I see. Unfortunately, I don't have any spare 1101 RAM laying around, so we will have to address this issue later. Alright, let's move on to the deposit circuit. As you can see, we can examine the contents of the memory locations, but depositing does not seem to persist in RAM. Let's do some more debugging and try to figure out why it's not persisting. After extensive debugging, I think I've narrowed it down to the connections between the address latch board and the memory board. With the oscilloscope connected to the right out pin of the address latch board, we can see that it spikes uh, when the deposit switch is toggled, which seems correct. However, if we connect the oscilloscope to the memory in pin of the memory board, the spike no longer occurs. This is very strange. It's as if there is a short causing the spike to disappear. Let's dig in a little deeper uh, to see what's happening. We may have found the issue. It seems that the pin we were scoping is not even connected to anything. All this time we were scoping an empty pin. I think this is an issue with the PCB. All the other similar connectors have the top and bottom pins connected together so that you could connect to either one, but this particular pin is not connected to the bottom pin. Very strange. 
Let's connect to the correct pin and test the deposit circuit again. Perfect! It was a simple fix, but it caused a lot of headache trying to find the problem. Now we can deposit data into memory and then examine it to verify that the data was indeed deposited correctly. Since we cannot continue with the test procedures outlined in the original documentation due to missing RAM, let's try to figure out why the load address high and load address low are both toggling each other. My first thought is that ICs might be experiencing a voltage drop uh, going under the minimum voltage threshold. I've tested the voltages and I do see a spike when the switches are toggled. Now I'm not sure if this is a spike due uh, to a voltage drop or not, but let's try increasing the voltage slightly to see if it makes a difference. It does not appear to be making a difference. How about installing uh, decoupling capacitors right on the ICs? It's a good practice to install decoupling capacitors for each IC in the circuit, and it looks like the Mark 8 is missing a few of these capacitors. Let's try adding some. Even with the decoupling capacitors, it does not seem to fix the issue. Although the issue has not been fixed, I will leave these capacitors uh, there as they won't hurt anything. I've been probing and scoping this circuit for a while now and haven't yet found the issue but I do see something strange happening. When the load address high is toggled, the load address low also shows a spike. When I disconnect the wire from load address uh, low and toggle load address high, the spike disappears. So something strange is going on here. After some digging, I believe we have found the culprit. These wires are all interfering with each other. And having separated them, the issue no longer persists. We can now toggle load address high and not have the low address being set along with it and vice versa. Fantastic. It's common to spend a lot of time debugging an issue, which is actually very trivial on the surface. Now I'm wondering if the examine circuit was acting up because of this same issue. I'll investigate that later. For the final wiring, we'll have all of these wires twisted and braided to uh, prevent interference, since even a tiny interference can cause issues in signal wires. I would like to continue with the test procedures, but if we try to run the test program now, it will most likely fail since one of the RAM chips is dead. I've just ordered more RAM, so we'll continue testing you when the RAM arrives. Welcome back again. Now that I have received the RAM and I've got plenty of it this time, we can continue with our testing. Let's enter the test program into the Mark 8. First, set the computer in the jam and step modes. Then set the switch register to all zeros and toggle load address low and load address high. Next, set the switch register to octal 104, toggle deposit. Set the switch register to all zeros, toggle deposit. And toggle deposit one more time. This simple program should run as a loop, jumping back to memory location zero over and over again. Set the switch register to octal 005, switch out of the jam mode, toggle interrupt, and then toggle step to step through the program. It appears that the program is not running correctly, as all the LEDs light up at once, indicating an issue. I will continue to debug the program, this time focusing on the CPU board. I won't bore you with the details, so I'll get back to you once I have something substantial to report. Mm -hmm. 
So far, I have not pinpointed the issue, but I suspect it might be a faulty 8008 microprocessor. I've gone ahead and purchased another one, as I'll need one for another project, so we'll continue with the debugging once it arrives. While we wait, let's complete the assembly of the computer by installing it into the enclosure. In the previous video, we finished building the enclosure for the computer. Uh, let's start by installing the components that will be housed underneath the enclosure. First, install four uh, long M3 bolts for the backplane. We will mount the backplane on these bolts later. We will use a metal plate to mount the power supply and power conversion board. This plate is approximately 10 inches long by 6 inches wide. It's also thick enough to uh, hopefully help dissipate the heat generated by the power supply. We'll use M4 bolts to mount it to the enclosure and the bolts will be hidden by the backplane on the other side. I use one nut to tighten each bolt before installing the plate. This will create some clearance between the plate and the wooden enclosure. The power supply and power conversion board will be mounted as shown in the video, but they can be mounted in any way desired. We're using M4 bolts for the power supply and M3 bolts for the power conversion board. I added extra nuts underneath the power conversion board for clearance as the heatsink bolt was in the way. We will also mount a terminal block, which will be used for the power lines coming into the enclosure. Once all of these components are mounted, we can install the metal plate into the enclosure using M4 nuts. The power supply wires will run to the terminal block. The black uh, or load wire will run to the switch connector and then from there to the terminal block. A standard computer cable was used for the power cord. The end was cut off and the protective jacket was stripped to reveal the three wires inside. The ground and neutral wires route to the terminal block while the black uh, load wire routes to the fuse holder and from the fuse holder to the terminal block. I also used some heat shrink tubes around the fuse holder connections and shrunk them using a torch. Finally, I installed a 4M fuse into the fuse holder. Mount the I.O. ports on the rear panel using M3 bolts. And then install the 80mm by 80mm fan into the fan port, placing a fan guard at the back. Use M3 bolts for this as well, preferably longer ones. So far so good. The fan is designed for 5 volts, and fortunately we have an extra connection on the power conversion board that we can use to power the fan. Connect the dark wire to ground and the lighter wire to positive 5 volts. Ignore the minus 9 volts. We're now ready for a smoke test. Let's plug in the cord and power on the power supply using the switch on the switch panel. The fan powers on and blows air out of the enclosure, which is exactly what we want. I may reduce the speed of the fan in the future as it's fairly noisy. It's also a good idea to double check the voltages coming out of the power conversion board to ensure they are positive 5 volts and minus 9 volts before continuing. Plug in the power harness and run it to the top through a cable port. On the other side, insert the backplane over the four bolts installed previously. 
I found that adding an extra nut underneath the backplane creates more clearance, especially considering the larger metal plate bolts that are located under the backplane. Connect the power harness into the backplane. The setup is looking good so far. Let's continue. Insert all the boards into the back plane and connect the top harness into the three boards. Notice how the boards are not exactly straight. We can fix this by using a piece of wood with grooves cut out for the boards. To mark the groove locations, place the wood against the connectors on the back plane and then cut them out with the miter saw. The last step is to hook up the switchboard with the connections on the computer. Although I initially considered building an interface board for this, and I might still do so, uh, for now I created a harness using 28 gauge color coded wires. And these wires are very flimsy so I installed a thick metal wire in the middle to create rigidity. Run the uh, 24 position connector to the inside of the enclosure and connect it to the switch panel. Mount it to the side of the enclosure to keep it secure. The other side of the harness will connect to each respective connection on the mini computer. I color coded them for easier identification. The purple wires are for power and plug directly into the backplane bus. Notice how the harness is twisted and braided. This is to prevent interference between signal wires. We have now completed the installation of the computer into the enclosure and everything looks great. One more thing. We want to make sure that everyone knows that this is a Mark 8 mini computer, so we'll add a little sticker to the front panel to highlight that. Adding identifying text to the switches also helps. Now we are ready to get back to testing. So, where did we leave off? Oh yes, our test program failed to run. Uh, while we were building the enclosure, I had ordered some spare parts that I thought might help resolve the issues we were having. One of them was a uh, spare 8008 microprocessor, and another was the 8267 multiplexers. Let's first try swapping the microprocessor and see if it changes anything. I had scoped the microprocessor previously and it seemed to be behaving correctly so I doubt that this is the culprit. The new microprocessor is now installed. Let's try the program again. Still no luck. The next thing we can try is to swap out the 8266 multiplexer that we currently have installed with the one specified in the original documentation, an 8267. Initially I did not think that there would be many differences between these two multiplexers, but having done some probing and scoping, it seems like the signal for the LEDs on the LED register board is coming from the input multiplexer board, and they are all ones. If we look at the truth table for the multiplexer, to get all ones, both of the select lines have to be ones as well. Based on my scopes, the select lines do not appear to be all ones, so there seems to be an issue with these multiplexers. Let's install the 8267 multiplexers and try the program again. Would you look at that? It appears that our program is actually running. The culprit must have been the multiplexers. 
Now, I don't know if it's due to a faulty 8266 or if it just requires the 8267, but at least we now know where the issue lies. Let's continue with the testing procedure and run one more program. The next program we will run will start at location 0 and increment the output register over and over again. This will test the dynamic operation of the Mark 8 mini computer. Let's go ahead and enter it. Set the switch register to 005, switch out of jam, actuate interrupt, set to run. The output register appears to be incrementing. Fantastic! I hope you've enjoyed watching this video and found it helpful. If you require any help with your computer, please do leave a comment and I will try to help if possible. In the next video, I hope to continue with the rest of the outline tests and do some of the experiments detailed in the original documentation. So uh, don't forget to like this video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. I'll see you in the next video.